Hello everyone, this is Shimon Yu from Georgia Tech. Welcome to this virtual meeting. And um, the title of my presentation today is Compute in Memory with Emerging Non-Volatile Memories, Challenges and Prospects. So if you have any questions after the presentation, feel free to send me an email uh, using this email address provided to the right button of this slide. So this work has been done by my other students, including Xiaoyu, Xiaochen, and Shenshi. So I'm happy to present the results of our recent progresses in this field. All right, so this is the outline of the presentation. First, I will give an overview of the computing memory, CIM technologies. And then we will review our recent XNOR R1 prototype chip. And then I will discuss the challenges in the number cell memory based CIM design. And lastly, we will present the DNN plus NeuroSIM benchmark framework developed in our group for benchmarking the CIM technologies from devices to circuits and algorithms. So the motivation for developing the hardware accelerators for machine learning or AI in general has been uh, shown in this slide. So the industry today actually rely on the GPU for the training in the cloud. And sometimes people use FPGA for inference and due to the recomputability for fast prototyping. And we also see the rise of the ASIC designs, including the TPU uh, for the acceleration of machine learning, both in cloud as well as the edge. So if you look at the energy efficiency of those computing platforms, for example, the GPU today is roughly about 0.1 tera ops per watt. So this is a throughput divided by power. And uh, the TPU, because of the spe specialization and the digital Mac operations uh, are suitable for the matrix operations in the machine learning algorithms. So the energy efficiency can be boosted to like around 1 to 10 teraops per watt. But if we want to further improve the energy efficiency, one of the promising approach is to do this analog Mac operations with the memories. So here, we are trying to embed the computation into the memory. For example, we can do the matrix vector multiplications within the memory array. If we can do that, then the energy efficiency can be expected to be like 10 to 100 teraops per watt. Of course, this benefits come from the, the features like the low precision and computation. Um, but of course, there are some question mark about this analog computing approach. That is, the accuracy of the computation may be sacrificed. So here, we are going to answer this question later in the presentation. So this is a so if we take a further look between the CMOS uh, digital deep neural network accelerator versus what we proposed here, computing memory based neural network accelerator. So here we can see some of the differences between those two approaches. So in the digital based design, uh, so there are many processing elements on the chip uh, to do the multiply and accumulate Mac operations. So essentially here we have the digital multiplier and adders, of course, the local registers and control to do the matrix vector multiplications in the PEs. And then we may store the parameters of the model, for example, the weights and activations in the shared SRAM buffer. And then we will design some special units to do the pooling activation and those uh, special functions. So here, no matter what, uh, we are going to optimize the data flow to increase the data reuse on chip and then try to minimize off-chip DRAM access. So this is a general 
computing paradigm at today's uh, deep neural network is accelerators if we use the digital Mac approach. Of course, as you can see here, still the data here, like activation and weights, are stored in the buffer, like the SRAM cache. And we still need to access those data row by row from the cache and then load them into the PEs to do the computation. So this is single row access, slow and inefficient. If you look at the computing memory approach, so here we are going to store the weights in the memory arrays and then only load in the input and activation, possibly in parallel to activate multiple rows. And then this input vector is encoded as a voltage signal to the VLAN of the memory array. And then this VLAN will activate the memory cell, which stores the weights as a conductance of the memory cell. So the voltage multiplied by the conductance will get current along the bit line. So we're going to sum up the current along the bit line. At the end of the column, we may use the analog to digital converters to convert the signal from the analog domain back to the digital domain. So in this case, we're going to enable parallel computation and eliminate the digital MAC units and also we will reduce the weight movement because the weights are stored in the memory. We only transfer the input and output activations uh, around the CNM macros on chip. So this is the difference between the two approaches. And uh, actually with this computing memory approach, uh, we can use CMOS technology to do the CNN. So we can modify, for example, the bit cell of the SRAN to be this twin eight transistor SRAN bit cell. For example, here as we show in this figure. So we have two SRAN cell, and then we're going to use this pass gates uh, to read out the data to the bit man. And we can also size those two pass gates, uh, the transistor's weights to be proportional to the significance of the data stored in the SRAN cell. So we can enable multiple rows of the SRAN array as well. So we can get the current summing up along the core. So this is uh, what we proposed and uh, the design was in collaboration with National Tsinghua University in Taiwan and the chip was tabled out and validated and the energy efficiency and the throughput number uh, is given by this uh, table here and uh, you can see that we can get like tens of terawatts per watt energy efficiency for the precision uh, of the weights and activations uh, in this range. So this uh, paper was published in ISCC 2019. So in this talk, we will skip the discussions on the SRAM based design and focus more on the emerging non-local memory based design. So why emerging non-local memory? Compared to the SRAM based design, the non-local memory, for example, the resistive random access memory, RN, offers much smaller cell size and possibly multi-bit per cell at the same technology load. So those emerging memories could potentially hold most of the weights on chip. For example, the state-of-the-art deep neural network model may need larger than 100 megabytes parameters. So if we can have embedded number of memory with a capacity more than this 100 megabytes, then we can hold all the weights on chip, then we can eliminate or at least reduce the off-chip DRAM access, which is very energy consuming. Another advantage for the emerging number time memory over the SRAM based design is because of its number utility, which means we can power off the chip without leakage, standby leakage. So this offers dynamic power gating for inference uh, design at the edge. In addition, 
those emerging number 10 memories are that kind of LAN compatible. So that means we can stack multiple layers of those memories potentially for the 3D stacking to increase the density eventually. So this table here summarized the, the recent designs and the prototype chips reported by different uh, groups. Uh, here we have the technology loads and the state of the art is around like 40 nanometer, 50 nanometer. And then the array size. So most of the designs are based on a single array. And recently we say that there are multiple uh, array based designs. Uh, up to like a megabit level. Still, there is a long way to go from the megabit level to like 100 megabytes uh, targets eventually. And also we can see the multi-bit per sale. So this illustrates the analog property of the memory cell. Ideally, we want to do multi-bit per sale to increase the density of the data storage. And then some of the designs enable the parallel readout and uh, some of the designs uh, integrate the ADC as edge of the array. And then the reported energy efficiency number can be up to like 60 teraops per watt. And the most the demonstrations today eh, are on the data set like CIFAR 10. And the accuracy reported from this test chip is around 81, 85%. This mostly is for inference. As you can see here, the accuracy is not as good as the software baseline, which is typically above 90% for the safe button. We will discuss why, what causes this degradation. Next, we're going to review our recent design, XNO RM prototype chip. So this chip was designed by our group and uh, with collaboration um, from Professor Jason Seals' group from Arizona State University. So here in this XNO RN chip, we are going to uh, map the XNO LED into the RM test chip. So here, this is for the binary in memory compute. And the design is shown here. So we have the one transistor, one resistor based design, and we group two of this kind of 21R cell as one weight, uh, which we will use the complementary states of the resistance to represent the positive one weight and the negative one weight, depending on the top cell or the bottom cell to be the high resistance state or low resistance state. Meanwhile, we're going to use complementary word lines, like the word line and word line bar, to represent the input polarity. For example, if the input is positive one, then the word line will be zero, where the line bar will be one. So if the input is negative one, then we're going to reverse the polarity, like the word line is one, where the line bar is zero. So depending on the input pattern and also the weight pattern stored in the bit cell, we're going to have the combinations uh, of the output in this truth table. So the output will be the current uh, discharge, the bit line here. So if the input is negative one and weight is negative one, then the output will be positive one. So that means we're going to discharge the bit line. So if it's the other case, that like input is negative one, weight is positive one, then the output will be negative one. So here you will see that we're going to only have the cell with parent state attached to the bit line. So the discharge of the current will be minimal. So overall, if you think about this design uh, with the peripheral circuits here, we have the analog max. And after that, we have a pull up PMOS uh, to the power supply. And then we will sense the bit line voltage at this node with the flash ADC based on multiple comparators, voltage mode. So the equivalent circuit of this array will be shown in this box. So the essentially here we have a voltage divider between the pull up PMOS. The strength of this PMOS can be reconfigurable by tuning the W over L in the runtime. 
and then the pull down network is due to this uh, memory array and then depending on the input pattern and the weight uh, pattern we're going to have different number of the discharge paths so this load voltage can be tuned and uh, 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 we can use the ADC to sense this node voltage to convert the analog signal to the digital output. So here the red figure shows the measured transfer curve of this node voltage as a function of the bit count value, which is the output from the uh, core. So here, because we have external net, we have both positive, both positive and negative outputs. So here we can have the theoretical minimum, which is negative 64, to the theoretical maximum, which is 64. And here you can see that the bit number voltage will monotonically reduce if we have larger bit count value or partial sum from the uh, core. So here we can tune the strength of the PMOS to select the best sensitivity of the uh, ADC. And and then we can use the ADC to digitalize the output. So here is the uh, prototype chip we taped out. And uh, here in the middle, we have the 128 by 64 array. Because we we'll use two cells represent one weight, effectively the array size will be 64 by 64 matrix. We have all the necessary creeper circuits uh, at the edge of the array, including the maps and also the flash ADC based on the voltage mode comparator, as we discussed earlier. And then this part uh, composed, uh, and this part uh, forms the analog module in this design. And also we have the digital controls of this design with the scanning and then the decoder and then the vector generation circuits and then the decoder. Uh, one more thing is that we need to convert the voltage domain from the digital logic power supply around like one volt to the R1 array operation voltage, which may require like three volts. So we have this level shifter in between the digital and the analog blocks. And you can see that from the layout point of view, the R1 array is pretty small and the peripheral surface is pretty large. So this is one of the challenges we are going to discuss later. So this design was taped out uh, at 90 nanometer with the help from the Wenbang Electronics, which is a Taiwanese company uh, who can integrate the hafnium oxide based R1 between the metal one and the metal two, as shown in this uh, cross-sectional TEM image of the uh, cell between the metal one and the metal two. All right, after we fabricate this chip, and the first thing we need to do for testing is to program the R1 to be in the desired state. So here we're going to map uh, the weight to be the high resistance state and low resistance state. So the HRS and LRS, because the current is dominated by the low resistance state. So we want to tighten the distribution of the low resistance state. So here we use very aggressive write and verify technique to tighten the distribution of the LRS resistance to be within one kilo ohm from the tail to tail. So this will guarantee the good mapping of the algorithm weights to the conductance of the devices, because eventually we rely on that conductance to do computation. And we sum up the currents along the columns. So we want each cell contribute the same amount of currents to the core. So this is the, after the verify. So we get very tight distribution of the LRS. Well, the HRS doesn't matter too much because the Current is very small for HRS cell, so it will, can be negligible to the bitman current. And after we programming the chip, then we're going to test the ADC output. 
And here you see that uh, we have the ideal ADC output here um, because we have three bit ADC. So we have eight levels as output. But this is actual measured ADC output from the chip. So ideally, we should have the diagonal as the output. But due to the process variation, the ADC offset, then we have a spread out of the ADC output. This means the inaccuracy of the readouts. This may contribute to the accuracy degradation later in the algorithm. So we want to somehow cancel this offset. So we fine tune the reference voltages for individual groups of the ADC. So let's say eight corners have their own ADC references. If we do that calibration, we can tighten the distribution of the output to be more focused on the diagonal. But still, we have some outliers uh, due to the process variation. And uh, after we calibrate the offset, then we run the software hardware code uh, experiments. So here we consider two data sets, that is MNIST and CIPA10. So MLP algorithm for the MNIST and the convolutional neural network based on VGG for the CIPA10. So here we are going to map the convolution operations to the memory array. And then we will do the rest computations like the pooling and the norm batch normalization using software simulation. So here, that means the weighted sum is read out from the chip. And then that weighted sum will be post-processed by the software. So here, at least, we capture the essence of the final computation in the test chip. So with this uh, mixed approach, we report the accuracy for the MLP, MNIST data set. So as you can see that if we somehow calibrate the offset, then we can achieve above 98% of the accuracy, well, which is close to the software baseline. And also if we calibrate the offset, then we can achieve like 83 to 84 percent accuracy for the safe button data set as well. So here we see that still this cannot match the software baseline, which is about 90 percent. We will discuss why is that later. So this is a comparison with the prior work uh, using the RN technology for computing memory. Um, at ICC 2019. So our technology load is older than this prior work, but we enable more rows simultaneously. So the prior work enable nine rows at one time, and we enable all the rows in this memory array, in this case, 128 rows. So with these differences, we can still achieve a better throughput because we enable more rows um, because we our technology load is uh, older, so our energy efficiency is not as competitive as the prior design. But overall, if we consider the EDP, energy delay product, essentially we use energy efficiency multiplied by the throughput, then we achieve that 3.2x better EDP compared with the prior design. And with this test chip, we further studied the possibility of multi-level programming with this RN technology. So if we want to store higher density of the data, then we want to use multiple conductance states to store multi-level bits. So this is possible with this kind of right verify protocol uh, shown here. And uh, here we tested four kilobit data for each state, and uh, less than 1.5 sigma is achieved in the conductance distribution of those eight levels as shown in this uh, histogram.
So market level is possible in the RN technology. However, we are concerned about the rate disturb. So this means the resistance may drift over time if we apply the rate operations to the memory cell. So here we char uh, characterize the drift of the resistance as a function of the stress time at different uh, bitman voltage for different states. So here we statistically measure the data and then fit it with a physical model. And then we can predict the resistance drift over time. And we incorporate this model into the neural network simulation for CIFA 20 set. And we can see the inference accuracy uh, drop as a function of the read cycle. So here, depending on the read voltage, then, of course, the smaller read voltage, smaller stress, then we can expect longer lifetime for the inference engine. But still, here we see that uh, even with 0 0.3 volts as the read voltage, the read cycle can be only like 10 to the power 7 cycles, at least for this technology. So this uh, means we need to further improve the device technology with better rate disturb immunity. Okay, next we're going to talk about the challenges. Based on the lessons we learned from our test chip, we summarized the following challenges for the emerging number of memory-based computing memory design. The first challenge, if we use RN technology, the RN technology typically has low unstate resistance and high write voltage. So the low unstate resistance will cause large column current. IR drop along the interconnect wires can be significant. So this will lead to the end of readout accuracy loss. And large, oh, sorry, low unstate resistance, large current. That means we need to place a very large end of max at the end of the column. So this will result in poor area efficiency. On the other side, the high red voltage, for example, if we need three volts to program the R1, that means we need to use IO transistor for the 1T1R cell. So the bit cell size may be larger than 30F square. So the benefits of the density may be lost. Secondly, if the red voltage is high, then we need to use a level shifter or charge pump circuitry to convert the voltage domain from the logic CDD at the 0.9 volts to the 3.3 .3 volts for the programming. So this will result in the poor area efficiency as we shown in this layout of our test chip. So here we did some prediction. If we can improve the device property, like increase unstate resistance from the 10 kilo ohm to 100 kilo ohm and reduce the right voltage from 3.3 .3 volts down to 1 volt, then we can save the area significantly due to the reduction of the level shifter area and the analog max area. And also, it can improve the rate of the energy, energy efficiency because the unstate resistance is higher. And also, it can reduce the right energy significantly because the voltage to program is reduced. And we know the CV square for the dynamic energy to charge and discharge the world of bit line. So it can save a lot of energy. So here we propose the device engineering targets for the future will be unstable resistance larger than 100 kilo ohm and the programming voltage to be compatible with the logic VDD like one volt. The second challenge we realized is ADC. And ADC is the area and power bottleneck. Uh, the ADC's requirement for computing memory actually is unique. It does not need very super high resolution or bandwidth. So typically next like three to five bits and less than one gigabit per second is sufficient for the inference engine design. However, there is a stringent requirement on the area penalty of the ADC. 
because ideally each corner needs to be equipped with 180C to maximize the parallelism. It is very difficult to achieve the same column pitch from the layout point of view because the memory array column pitch is pretty small, but the ADC typically is very large in the size. Due to these considerations, so in practice, we have to share the ADC among multiple columns. That means we cannot read out all the columns at one time. We have to do multi -time, multiplex uh, 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 to read out the ADC output in multiple cycles. So this is not ideal, and this is a key challenge in the circuit design. In terms of the ADC, uh, we can have options like the flash ADC or the SAR ADC. Between the SAR and flash ADC, so here it is some simple bench, uh, comparison uh, at the 40 nanometer technology load. So here this is a SAR ADC. We only have one uh, comparator, but with the SAR logic to tune the references in multiple cycles. And then the flash ADC, of course, then we have multiple comparators uh, with different references, and we can get the output in one cycle. Uh, apparently, with the higher resolution, then the SAR ADC will be better because the flash ADC will exponentially explode in terms of the area and energy. But on the other side, the SAR ADC will be slower because it will need multiple cycles. Uh, this is linearly proportional to the resolution we need. So the general conclusion is that uh, if the ADC requirement is 3-bit or below, then the flash ADC is a better choice. But if the ADC resolution is uh, like 4 bits or above, then probably the star ADC is a better choice. And the third challenge we realize is the process variation. So this is inherent with analog computation. So we see the inference accuracy drop by the process variation, and the primary variation source includes the cell-to-cell -cell unset resistance variation and the ADC offset. So the cell-to-cell -cell unset resistance variation can be minimized by the iterative red verify techniques. As we shown earlier, we can achieve less than 1.5% uh, sigma for the conductance distribution for eight levels. So the more critical challenge is the ADC offset. Uh, so this cannot be tuned uh, by the programming. So this is due to the process variation. Uh, of course, we can employ some offset cancellation techniques for the ADC. However, that will further increase the size of the ADC, which is already the bottleneck for the area efficiency. So the ADC offset will be the bottleneck for the design in terms of the accuracy. So the trade-off between the accuracy and the area of the ADC will be the key challenge. So here we just uh, started the impact of the ADC offset and proposed some techniques to retrain the neural network to adapt to this kind of ADC offset. So here is a simple uh, current mode sense amplifier, and uh, uh, we will uh, have the offset. So that means the uh, partial sound distribution uh, will be compared against the reference, and the reference for different uh, chips may have the offset. So here we run the Monte Carlo simulations uh, at 40 nanometer technology load, and the sensing passing rate means the correct output from the ADC will drop as we increase the partial sum. If the current will be larger, then it's more challenging to sense correctly. And with this kind of uh, passing rate, we can run the software algorithm to see the accuracy drop. And we can see that the accuracy will drop or not uh, if the W over L of the the sum is one. But we can apply the retraining method to fine tune the weights to each individual chip 
If we can do that, then the accuracy can be recovered to some extent. And of course, we can blindly just increase the size of the transistors to minimize the offset. Then the accuracy can be similar as a software baseline. However, this comes with the overhead of the area penalty. So here we can find some optimal design uh, with the retraining method applied to fine tune the weights for each individual chip. Of course, this will bring in the cost of the testing. So there is still no perfect solution to this ADC offset at this moment. Lastly, I will spend uh, some time on this benchmark framework we developed to, uh, to, to do the design space exploration for the computing memory based accelerators. So this framework is called DNN plus Rosin. And uh, we presented this framework uh, in IEDM conference back in December 2019. So this framework integrates the neural scene, which is a circuit level simulator with the PyTorch and TensorFlow, which are the popular machine learning packages in the Python environment. So we have an end-to-end -end framework from the devices to circuits, to architectures, to algorithms. So the neural scene core is a simulator based on C++, which can estimate the energy efficiency throughput and area and memory utilization of the chip. And then the Python wrapper will report the inference accuracy of the design, considering the hardware constraints into the algorithm, including the unideal effects like the device retention or the rate stress drift of the conductance, and also the ADC quantization effect and the ATC offset. So the framework was published uh, in the GitHub. It's open source. So the version 1.1 is for inference, and it was released in December 2019. And uh, in this March 2020, we released a new version, Wave 2.0. So this version enables on-chip training. So this is an overview of the framework. So here we have the neural thing core based on C++ and then a Python wrapper uh, based on the PyTorch and TensorFlow. So we can set up the neural network structure in the Python wrapper, and then we can train the model and then run the inference with those hardware constraints. And then we can save the real traces like the neural activations, synaptic weights, and then we can uh, output of those parameters from the Python wrapper to the neural thing core to run the hardware performance estimation. So we will plan the flow plan of the chip and then map the weight uh, from the software to the hardware. And then we will estimate the hardware performance like the area latency energy leakage. So here, let's take a look at the Python wrapper. So in this Python wrapper, we're going to define the neural network structure, like how many layers and uh, what curl size for each layer. And then we're going to introduce the device and circuit non-ideal properties into the accuracy estimation. As we discussed earlier, the resistance or conductance of the devices may drift over time due to the stress. And also the ATC quantization will introduce the partial sum quantization laws. So we're going to introduce those kind of effects into the software algorithm simulation to look at the accuracy drop as a function of those uh, device and circuit non-ideal effects. Here's just an example with the VGG8 for C pattern data set. So this is a default example in the framework. So here is a neural network structure and here is an example of the C pattern data set. So when we run the framework, Firstly, we are going to run this Python wrapper, and then we are going to load in the parameters from the Python wrapper to the neural thing core, for example, neural network structure and the synaptic weights and neural activations. So this will be a real trace-based uh, simulation. 
and here are some those are looked as a mapping of the algorithms to the hardware. So we're going to map the activations as voltage vectors to the hardware and then map the weights to the conductance of the number of memories or the digits to the SRAM based design. So here we have different mapping strategies. I will skip the details and then we will have a hierarchy in the chip. So at the top level, we have the chip and then we have multiple tiles in the chip and the multiple PEs in one tile and the multiple synaptic arrays in one PE. So we have this hierarchy in the architecture. So this is what we just discussed, this hierarchy, chip level to the tile level to the PE level. So at each level, we will have the input and output buffer. And also we will have the routing and the other tree to sum up the partial sum from the lower level blocks. So this is a hierarchical simulations. So let's look at the lowest level, that is a synaptic array level. So this is like one sub array of the design. So we provide three options for the technology. So we have S run as a baseline, and then we offer the two terminal number time memory synapses. Like the R run, we have this 21R design, and also three terminal number time memory synapses. Like the very electric transistor is a three terminal synaptic devices. And we have the, all the circuit module around the subarray, like the switch matrix for the world and midnight source line, and the MUX and the ADC, and also the adder and the shift register to represent multiple precisions of the inputs. We consider the non-ideal device properties into the software baseline. So here we consider the data retention drift of the conductance. If the conductance is drift over time using this formula, this is for phase change memory. And uh, we don't have the ideal model for this kind of uh, drift. So then we assume the following scenarios uh, or schemes for the drift. For example, if all the conductance drift to the maximum, all the conductance drift to the minimum, or they drift to the middle, or they randomly drift. So with those kind of models, we can simulate the inference accuracy as a function of time. For example, if 10% of the conductance drift over 10 years, or 6%, or 2%. So we can get the accuracy as a function of time, depending on the drift target. We found out that the random drift will be most robust to the uh, drift effect. And also we can look at the ADC quantization effect with the linear quantization and nonlinear quantization. And uh, we can simulate the accuracy as a function of the ADC precision. This is as shown in one of the previous slides. Uh, for example, here, if we have 256 by 256 array, and if the memory cell is four bit per cell, so effectively we will get like 11 bits from the bit line. But in practice, we just may need five bit ADC to, for the quantization. So we can and save the partial sum on precision by using this kind of uh, design and exploration. And here we show some of the uh, trade-offs between the area energy efficiency and throughput using this uh, half oxide RN devices. Uh, for this 128 by 128 array. So I will skip the details between the trade-offs like area, energy efficiency, and throughput. So we can tune the AEC precision and the cell precision. So here is another look at the metrics we are interested in for this design. So we have the, like, the energy efficiency, area, accuracy, throughput, and memory utilization. So depending on the ADC precision, we can optimize the design according to the metrics. And eventually we can put up this uh, benchmark table 
Uh, this is for CIFAR 27 inference only. And uh, here we did the benchmark at 32 nanometer between the baseline of SRAM based design versus emerging memories from RAM phase change memory, ferroelectric transistor, and so on. So as you can see here at the same technology load, the emerging memories will be better in terms of the area and also the energy efficiency throughput than the SRAM based design. And the key metric for the device is the large unstable resistance, for example, here 100 kilo ohm. So if you have that range of the conductance states, then the energy efficiency will be improved. But if you compare the technology with 7 nanometer SRAM, which is the state of the art, then the 7 nanometer SRAM, if we enable parallel results, then it will achieve the best energy efficiency and throughput simply because of the scanning. So here, this is the summary, just using the radar plot to show the trade-off between different metrics for different technology. Again, as you can see here, 7 nanometer SRAM parallel design will offer the best. Our framework can also support larger network. So here, just an example for ResNet 18 for ImageNet. And here we show the results of the FE FET based design. And uh, I will skip the details, just show the uh, scalability of this framework. And the last two slides, just want to emphasize that the challenges in the in situ training with non local memory. So far, we only discussed the inference engine design. But if you want to train the neural network with the non volatile memories on chip, then we have to overcome the challenges like the nonlinear and asymmetric weight update, as shown in this slide. So here we show the normalized conductance as function of the programming pulses in the device. So when you increase the weight, it may follow this trajectory. And when you decrease the weight, it may follow the other trajectory. So this is asymmetry. And then to overcome this asymmetry, we propose to introduce a momentum in the weight update. So here we will not only use the gradient of the current step, but we will also use the gradients of the previous step to predict what is the delta W to be applied in this current step. So this is called the momentum. So if we employ this kind of momentum technique, then we can say that we can compensate the degradation of the uh, training accuracy as function of this nonlinearity, and we can improve that significantly. But still, the accuracy drop is obvious uh, with the baseline accuracy. This is the last slide. We can extend our framework for the on chip training. So here we report the breakdown of the uh, components in terms of area and latency and energy. So here the conclusion is that the ADC dominates the area, the buffer dominates the latency, and the DRAM dominates energy for the training. And if you look at all the steps in the training process, like fit forward, backward propagation, and the weight gradient calculation and weight updates. And actually, the weight gradient calculation, that is a multiplication between the arrow and the activation, that will contribute to the most latency and energy in the whole training process. Okay, this is the summary of the talk. And uh, uh, here we talk about the computing memory, and we think that the computing memory can save the intermediate data movements, thus we can improve the throughput and energy efficiency. So computing in SRAM technology at the advanced technology nodes still performs the best. Today's emerging memory, like the RAM, can be tuned into multi-level, possibly with the iterative programming. And then we think the offline training for the inference is still the most suitable applications with advantages over SRA because we can do this dynamic power gating to save the power for the edge device. But the slight inference accuracy degradation in the analog computing memory architecture is caused by this process variation of ADC offset. So this is the key challenge we need to overcome. And this may bring the overhead of the testing and retraining from chip to chip. 
And also the inference engine design still faces the challenges like the high write voltage, low unstate resistance, ADC overhead, and so on. So our group provided this DNN plus neuroscience from work, and we believe this would be a good tool for the community to benchmark across different technology and to do the early design space exploration. With this, I'd like to thank my collaborator, Professor Jason Steele at Arizona State University and all the students involved in this research. And this research is sponsored by NLSF and the SRC, in particular, the Ascent Center within the SRC. Thank you.